Hello, Phil Cumming, bienvenue, konnichiwa. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again, episode 177 on Sunday, the 28th of March. I'm Armish Phil. I'm Armish Ben. I'm Armish Matt. And tonight's guest is an award-winning science and technology writer uh, and the author of the new book, Bitten, The Secret History of Lyme Disease and Biological Weapons. You can go to www.chrisnewby.com. To find out more, links in the description as always. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thanks very much for the invite. I have to ask, why what, why the title of your podcast? Because you don't seem like an Amish guy, and Amish are peaceful folk. So. We are peaceful. We are peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> Whose turn is it to handle that question? Uh, ben, it's always Ben's turn. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Um, I guess um, it's it harks back to uh, Monty Python and the Spanish Inquisition, and no one expected us to us three to do a podcast. Uh, and then we kind of had a, a techie link at the start of it, but then with no one listening, it would be suitable for Amish folk <laughs> uh, who don't use any technology. So. Yeah, I don't know. It's a bit. It's a bit weird, but it, um, it's uh, it's stuck with us now. So we it's, can't get rid of it, unfortunately. Yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> it's like naming a band. You know, it's, it's a, exactly. It's a difficult it's job. Memorable. Yeah, I have we, to say, the opening uh, modem handshake brings up all this deja vu anxiety from the eighties. It's like, am I going to get the handshake? Am I going to get on the internet? <laughs> it's just like, oh, I'm so nervous. So, anyways, I'll try to calm down now. Yeah, it is quite weird to be part of this generation that remembers life before the internet. I know. Yeah, because it's been just such a game changer, hasn't it? I know. Mm. I know. Good for writers. Yeah, so is this um, sort of things like Substack and uh, Medium and, and such like that? Has that been a benefit, do you think, for, for uh, writers such as yourself? Uh, yeah, because, well, and podcasts too, because podcasts are forever and you can have an interview and it's there forever, but mostly it's great for research because all of a sudden I can get to these um, really valuable online resources that I would have to get a plane ticket for before before the digital streaming miracle. Yeah, and, and sort of hunting around public libraries as well. And um, I would just say you, on your website, you've got a page there with lots of interesting um, documents that you've shared and, and photographs of, of old declassified stuff and that so it's a useful resource to have isn't it yeah it really is it really is um yeah. how long have you been looking into Lyme disease now well my husband and I got it in 2002 so that's almost 20 years ago that's when it became my favorite disease as a survival tactic because we were super sick and the symptoms that we have well for a year we didn't know what we had and uh it was life or death really um and so I started researching it. Finally, it took 10 years, 60,000 US dollars and uh, 10 doctors to get diagnosed for Lyme disease, even though we'd been vacationing in Massachusetts, which was the number two spot for Lyme disease. And all of those doctors I had said in the beginning, you know, here's our, how our symptoms roll out. Sounds like it could be Lyme. This place has a problem with Lyme. And they all said, no, that's a rare disease. I, I went back to California. No, that's a rare disease. Lyme disease doesn't have those symptoms. So being a science writer and engineer, it's like, hmm, this is weird because the symptom set that I'm having and other people are is so different than what the medical literature says. So what's going on here? And I'm just a really curious person, a, a researcher. So I started digging into it. I did a documentary on Lyme disease and learned that the problem was way bigger than anyone really realized. And then I said, that's enough with Lyme disease. I got better and and then uh, a couple of things happened that launched the book, which we can get into later. <laughs> yeah, well, just to stick on the, the documentary, uh, Under Our Skin, it's called. 
um, which I watched over the weekend. And uh, one of the things that was quite striking to me was sort of the almost the callousness with which the various doctors and the medical prof- profession were treating these people who, who obviously had really debilitating illnesses. Um, yeah, and it, there's a quite a bit of stigma to say you have Lyme disease because the really? published medical literature says um, it's easy to diagnose, treat, and cure. Uh, the tests are good. Two to four weeks of doxycycline, a cheap antibiotic, will cure you. And if you have lingering symptoms, even though they're the symptoms that you had in the beginning and they came back, that's something else. And you know, there's guidelines for treating that say, Oh, well, those symptoms are you're a hypochondriac, you had a past life trauma, um, you're just suffering from the aches and pains of daily living. Get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, and it, ended, it ended up uh, sort of giving me purpose in life because I felt like this is a horrible injustice being done to people who are truly sick. And it's devastating children and whole families. People are losing their jobs because they're totally denying that long haul Lyme exists medical insurance won't cover it. I've I've talked to families or when we interviewed families that said, yeah, our whole family has chronic Lyme. We're selling our last couch so we can afford another month of antibiotics. And, you know, these aren't opioids. They're not addictive. No one likes to be on antibiotics, but if it's the difference between living a normal life and being in constant pain or brain fog, you know, give us the cheap antibiotics. Yeah, one of the things that I was thinking about is um, why this disease seems to be treated differently from other similar diseases. So take malaria, for example, which has a similar sort of vector in that it's mosquito that transmits the disease. But, you know, people who get malaria are often, I believe, don't they pretty much have it for life? It can be an ongoing thing that can recur. And why is this, it got me, just got me thinking, why is this disease specifically being treated differently? Well, that's the, the why, why, why that kept me digging deeper. I mean, I did the film and certainly one explanation for uh, what's happened in the medical establishment was the small group of people. I mean, the disease was discovered in, or identified around the cause of invasion of the disease about 82, which is the year that AIDS was discovered. And uh, the group of about a dozen medical academic medical researchers um, jumped in on the discovery and they went in and they patented uh, uh, the surface proteins of the bug and they developed test kits and a vac- and a couple vaccines that they wanted to monetize for this disease. And, you know, the cure is cheap, over, you know, really cheap antibiotics, no patents available. So if you look, if you compare AIDS and Lyme disease, AIDS, it's a virus and they could patent new drugs for it. With Lyme disease, they couldn't. So they put their focus on a vaccine and the test kits and they rushed the science. So they didn't really understand the organism that well. And there's profit motive involved. So, and they team the researchers teamed up with the insurance companies who could deny chronic Lyme and it would save them money. The original researchers were protective on their technologies and their extremely bad tests. And we're stuck with those tests over 30 years later. Uh, and they're still control these researchers still controlling the narrative of what the disease is. So that, you know, that the the greed profit thing, that was and, and pride, because they said the disease is one thing and we're learning it's more nefarious than we thought before. That was one thing. But then I believe that another component is there's a cover-up associated with the discovery of this disease. Uh, and that's what the book goes into, is there is this secret history of the discovery of the disease. And I believe uh, that one of the things that was making people sick in that area was one or more biological weapons that were released or got out accidentally and they blamed everything on the Lyme disease spirochete, the bacterium, and they tried to cover up the rest. So that's, that's what I go into the history of the biological weapons program, the history of the really interesting scientist who uh, took the glory for the discovery. And then towards the end of his life, he says, well, I sort of fudged the science. I didn't tell you everything. And, uh, and it ends up being this really great Cold War mystery story. 
Right. So tell, tell us a bit more about the discovery then. 1982, I think you said it was, was it? Well, 82 was when they identified the bacterium. But right. in the late 1960s, which is the height of the Cold War program and the height of the top, top secret uh, bug borne and biological weapons program. And it was, uh, so the, the biological weapons program um, in the U.S., and they also did it with the U.K. and Canada, uh, it was as almost as big and secretive as the Manhattan Project for Nuclear weapons and um it just there there was a sort of bug born weapons arms race with the russians and us as spies leaked this and that and in the late 60s there were a whole lot of sort of open air pilot studies on weaponizing insects and and germs that are carried by bugs and so anyways the thing i discovered in the beginning of the research is that there were three freaky bug tick-borne illnesses that broke out in the late 60s and it just took 20 years for them to come clean with what you know what was going on but they you know it, it, there was Lyme arthritis there was this malaria-like disease called babesiosis which was cattle born and previously had only been found in cattle but all of a sudden it was in man just like the weird COVID thing and um and then there was a a spotted fever, little tiny bacterium called a rickettsia, and that was spreading on Long Island and killing people. And it, it, since the discovery of antibiotics, it had hardly killed anyone. So there was all this activity going, and it really pointed to some unnatural man-made outbreak. And and then I go into the discovery, and the discoverer of Lyme disease said, I was told, that, he said, accidents happen, I was told, to, to not talk about the other things that we found in the ticks and the people who were sick around Lyme, Connecticut. Right. So this is the, is this the idea that the tick doesn't just have Lyme disease, spirochete in it, it has other agents in there that are, are we saying, manufactured? Well, the manufactured part hasn't been proved that that's what caused that outbreak. But there's ample documentation that said they were working on engineering, uh, you know, living systems, bacteria, viruses, they were combining them together. And uh, I think one of the most compelling pictures that's on my website is Willy Bergdorfer, I, the Dis Bergdorfer, the discoverer of Lyme disease. They have pictures of three ticks pressed in clay and each tick has a glass pipe debt, pipette shoved in its mouth and their disease agents in the, inside the pipette and they're force feeding the different diseases inside the ticks. And the plan was to develop the perfect tick, the perfect germ inside the tick. So you could drop it on an enemy, the tick wouldn't arouse suspicion. It looked like a native tick. It would crawl far and wide it would be the perfect stealth weapon because you wouldn't have a fingerprint on the back of the tick or <laughs> and uh it would they had different versions it would either kill the enemy or um incapacitate the enemy and that would be part of a a multi-strategy war you know you'd weaken the population and then drop bombs on them or in you know have your soldiers invade and you'd vaccinate your soldiers Right, so, you'd have the vaccine ready. So the, prepared. Yeah, and so you, the thing is, there's just thousands and thousands of these experiments in the lab. Then they would be moved to a pilot program in, in Fort Detrick in Maryland, and then they would be tested in open air situations in Dugway, Utah, or um, Suffield Station in Canada near Calgary. And then they might even, if they thought the germs were not that bad, they might even test them. In, on Americans without them knowing it. And so one thing I did was I covered some of those open air, really uh, so unethical experiments. There's one where they put live bacteria in a light bulb and crashed it down a vent in the New York subway system. And the subways would rush by and it would create a vacuum as it went by and it would suck those live bacteria throughout the whole New York City um, subway system and 
undercover guys would have sniffers in their, you know, one was a woman, had a purse, one had a briefcase, one had camera equipment. And they, you know, they determined that if that had been anthrax, because they chose a bacteria that had the same physical size and density of anthrax, they could have like knocked out a huge percentage of New York City. So they were doing this. They did that uh, in the Pennsylvania tunnels. Uh, They did it uh, spraying bacteria on a tugboat uh, up and down San Francisco Bay in the fifties. So, who's 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 behind these uh, experiments? Well, it's the U.S. military, and at that time, the program involved all branches of the military. Pretty much, uh, the brains of the outfit was in Fort Detrick, Maryland, and it was mostly run by the Army. Within Fort Detrick, there was a small cadre of CIA agents and. They had a special operations division, so they had really secretive need-to-know experiments that a lot of times weren't written down. Um, they're the people that are responsible for the LSD experiments, and uh, they're responsible for the one uh, really interesting story that I wrote about, about Cuba. Hmm. So in 1962, the Kennedy brothers were pretty chapped about how their Bay of Pigs operation was thwarted. So they wanted payback for communist leader Fidel Castro. So they had this Cuba project, Operation Mongoose, with, you know, about 100 evil plots. And one of them was uh, dropping infected ticks on the Cuban sugar workers. Uh, So I actually accidentally or serendipitously met one of the CIA dark ops guys who said, you know, he was drinking, he was in his cups in this, at this party. He reminded me of that salty captain on Jaws, you know, who'd survived the U.S. Indiana, you know, he's. And he starts, I said, oh, you know, I didn't know anybody at this party. And I said, oh, what do you do for a living? He says, well, I was CIA dark ops and I worked for the company. <laughs> and and so uh, a couple drinks into it, he was telling me all the horrible things he did in Vietnam, <laughs> like <laughs> dropping decapitated heads on the Viet Congs and on and on. And I'm just, there are other people at the table. We're just like blown away. Uh it was too horrid to not be true. And then, and then the thing he said towards the end of the conversation is not knowing who I was at all. And I'd just done this documentary. He says the strangest thing I ever did was drop boxes of infected ticks on the Cuban sugar workers. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And then that was the seed that said, well, if this really happened, I, I have to confirm it, but the people need to know this because you know, Cuba's 50 miles as the bird flies from Florida. And these were deadly or incapacitating germs in the ticks. He, it turned out whatever he, whatever he was dropping on the Cubans, he brought it back to his home and infected his newborn baby who oh. almost died. Oh. And the only reason his son was alive because there was a Cuban resident there, physician who knew how to treat him. So, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's just so much military hubris to think you can perform all these experiments and not have blowback. Mm. Uh, Do you, um, how were you sort of confirming all these live experiments? Is it because of the things that have been declassified in the meantime or? Yeah. So there's just hundreds of people like me who pick one rabbit hole to go down and start researching it. And then we share our documents. So it's interesting that there were, there was plague and flea experiments. So those had been declassified and, it, and then I got secret documents from Willie Bergdorf or I, who had held some back, had stashed them in his garage in Montana and the NIH, when he was getting old and they were worried about what he'd do, that stuff came to his house and, and collected all his files and he held these back, the, the secret biological weapons program. So the NIH took them. It took six years to put them in the National Archive in Maryland. I went there and looked through them, and there was just huge holes in what I knew he had done. 
and there was this mysterious agent called Swiss agent. And an agent is a bacteria that it hasn't been officially named yet and right. might be, is a disease agent basically. And so then I went back to him and that's where he told me, yeah, I put uh, plague and fleas. That was my first job when I came from Europe uh, in Montana for a, he worked for the Public Health Service, <laughs> which is now NIH, National Institutes of Health. And uh, and I put uh, deadly Trinidad fever virus in mosquitoes. And I, I worked to try and get mosquitoes and ticks to reproduce faster. That's really what you want to do. You know, if you're going to release these insects in the nature, oh, we're going to get these parasites to have more babies. <laughs> it's just so diabolical. And then he, of course he, but so those, the fleas and ticks were some parts of that were declassified. I got more details of what he stuffed in them from his secret files that he donated to a BYU professor to put into the archives outside of the government. So I got early access to that, but no one until then had known that ticks were weaponized. And that was a revelation. And that also the U.S. government celebrated Willie Bergdorf or I for discovering the Lyme disease, you know, even though he did these biological weapons experiments and he, you know, he held, withheld important information on his discovery. Now, to anyone listening who's struggling to, uh, let's say, struggling to believe that the government would be so unethical. I mean, we all, we all, I think, have heard of the Tuskegee experiment now, which you know, I yeah. Bill Clinton apologising for. This is not beyond um, <laughs> the sort of moral compass, is it, to to conduct th- uh, experiments like these on the population? Yeah, and it's just only recently that the reparations were made to the families of that, and that's that a lot of them were the same players that did the Tuskegee experiment as the things I'm talking about, yeah. the operation. And it's only and, because whistleblowers came forward that we would have found out at all. Right. And Agent Orange is the same thing. So Agent Orange was a defoliant. Uh, and <laughs> that was like one of the huge revelations in my book. My dad's in his 80s. And as I got to the end of the book, he says, oh, yeah, I... I forgot to tell you, I delivered the first shipments of Agent Orange to Vietnam because he was a Navy pilot. And it was just like, oh, there's some karma at work. <laughs> yeah, you're My paying his karma off. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, we were combining anti-crop aid. At that time, it's the Cold War. There were no rules. The ends justified the means. They were combining anti-crop with anti-livestock agents with anti-human agents uh, and I, like one of the documents you can see on my website is particularly diabolical it's some bean counter in the military determined that it costs a dollar 33 to kill one person with tularemia which is a little bacteria that is carried by ticks like and they were trying to convince the pentagon to fund them because Look at this is so much more economical to kill people than <laughs> nukes. A dollar thirty three, that's how much a life was worth. Wow. It's just incredible, isn't it? I know. Yeah. So but I mean you have to say a lot of bad stuff happened in the Cold War. Why is this story important? Yeah, what's so the relevance that, today? Yeah, so that's the aspect of it that I find interesting is that that secret is harming people today. And in a way, the tick experiments that I go into, the open air tick experiments where they release hundreds of thousands of Lone Star ticks, which are non-native on the east, up northeast, and now are native and are carrying more diseases like spotted fever and this crazy alpha gal meat allergy. So, you know, it's 50 years later and... The, we've released these non-native insects and the germs that they carry, and it's still causing disease. And our government, because they're afraid of the secret, is trying to suppress the truth. I mean, the, the liability involved would be astronomical, just like the Agent Orange reparations and the Tuskegee experiment and the SHAD, which is shipboard hazard, things they sprayed on Navy ships. Uh, so they don't want it to come out, but people are sick. So I say these tick-borne experiments are like the American Chernobyl. It's killing people, animals, and 
the military needs to come clean is my point yeah and um uh, that's one of these sort of common things is that we often don't find out about these things until the main perpetrators are long in the ground and um, we have this in this country we have injunctions don't we that are put up for 20 30 years on mm-hmm. investigations and and uh yeah they're just covering it in their own backs essentially aren't they yeah yeah so this is part of your your reason for doing this to try and get this into the the public domain more and and bring it to people's attention yeah and i think the fundamental science for lyme disease is corrupt it's a corrupt foundation and once there's a certain kind of trust in the scientific community and and people have been going down the wrong pathways on the science because they trusted the people from Harvard and Yale and New York medical college who wrote this stuff. Right. So part of what my book is to say is, Hey, there was Lyme wasn't the only thing ma- making people sick. There was this spotted fever. There was this Babesia. And when they're combined together in a tick, I mean, there aren't that many insects that can deliver, uh, you know, three to five deadly diseases at once. And, and inject it into your bloodstream. And oh, by the way, the saliva of the tick suppresses your immune system for a week and uh, and gives these germs a head start. So really, we need to be looking at the problem differently. Researchers at prestigious universities tend to, because of science, like to isolate one thing at a time, like one bug causes one set of symptoms. But we have a different scenario here where you can have multiple diseases they present totally differently and we're just not writing about that in the scientific literature and people are especially the frontline physicians are working on bad information i mean it happened to my family if you watch under our skin which you can watch on amazon prime for free if you have a subscription it's crazy presentations because this is a neurological disease and we need to get better we need to you need to use insurance records and ai to really have a snapshot on, okay, this person has Lyme and Babesia, this person has Bartonella and Lyme, you know, just better is, information. Is, is that unique to these uh, to these cases in that the tick is carrying multiple bacteria or is this something that happens in, in other species? I, I think in a, nat- a natural evolutionary process, uh, the interaction between a parasite and the germs within and the collateral damage in, in that germ's life cycle, it, it optimizes itself so that there's typically one germ inside of one insect. But I think with man's intervention here, a lot of different things were released. So we're seeing in a study out of Columbia, um, this guy named Torcars and Ian Lipkin, Ian Lipkin's a famous virus hunter, they're finding that the typical tick is carrying multiple pathogens now. Now you could say it might be we just have better tools to detect the viruses, but I think anybody who's lived on the East Coast for a while says, remembers the old old timers, yeah, I, I was out in the woods all the time in the 60s, but something happened in the 60s that all of a sudden people are getting sicker. So I would say my book reframes the argument and says, hey, widen your lens it's not Lyme that was a nice, convenient uh, perp, a, a misdirection for what was happening to all these people. Widen your lens. There's a part of this scene that they don't want you to see. And hopefully I'll inspire some scientists to get their gene su- sequencers fired up and start looking inside the ticks. I mean, that's what's happening with Ian Lipkin in Columbia. Right. So is the, is the prevalence increasing still? year on year as far as these uh, these ticks go and the ticks that carry Lyme, because presumably not all ticks carry Lyme disease? Uh, it's unrelenting and spreading far and wide. So there's a map on my website on the images page, and it shows there's two point sources. There's one, you know, right around New York City, Lyme, Connecticut, starts out in the late 60s, really small, and you can see it growing year by year. The other hot spot is in northern Wisconsin, you might ask, well, why Northern Wisconsin? Well, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, that's where the um, the visionary, the founder of the US bioweapons program was the dean of the university there, and he ran a bunch of pilot programs in <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> he 
he was working on anthrax, uh, experimenting on cows. They recently discovered, oh, oh, some of those cows with anthrax, they had buried them in a far out field near the university. And then someone was saying, oh, we're going to build a building here. And they go, oh, you better get the mitigation people in there. You know, so uh, it's it's a mess. And That's a coincidence, like isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I focus, I mean, I don't, I have, I went to the archives in Wisconsin and it was appalling. Oh, they did a lot of uh, wheat rust experiments because they wanted to uh, kill the wheat crops in the Ukraine when the Russians were the bad guys. So, but they would do pilot studies on farms that were donated to the university. And so, you know, that's our own bread basket. Why? Why? And if you ever watch the TV show, the Americans, they go into the wheat rust thing and it's, it's all true. Oh my God. I mean, it's just sort of, I talk about playing with, it's playing with fire to the extreme, isn't it? Do it they, is. Do they just have no concept of, what unintended consequences are or did you do they just not care what's the mold what's the motivation for them doing this well it, it's uh emotionally driven the threat of communism mccarthyism and you just have to see what happened when the 9 11 towers happened they, people just overreacted and so people doing books like me it's a reminder we can learn from history you know, recently the Zika thing took off and all of a sudden we're genetically engineering mosquitoes and releasing them thinking, oh, uh, we'll take CRISPR, which is a cut and paste genome thing, and we'll, we'll splice something in on the male mosquitoes and they'll be sterile and then uh, there'll be less mosquitoes that carry Zika. But <laughs> that whole experiment backfired because... Nature finds a way. Nature always wins. And somehow the year that they released there, a year after they released them, there were more mosquitoes than ever. Really? Yeah. I've not heard that. A CDC person told me that. I've, I'm, so I'm not really familiar. It's been a, a few years, maybe three or four years, is it, since the emergence of, of Zika virus? And I guess because we're just so detached from South America, we didn't really, it wasn't just, really in the yeah. public consciousness, was it, over here? Just maybe for the Olympics, wasn't it, when it was in Rio? Well, but you had you, you should have seen in America they overreacted, and so all the resources that could have gone to tick-borne diseases, because it's just a very small group in the CDC and local health departments that do vector-borne diseases, so that would be fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. And so when you have the scare, I mean, Zika was more scary because it affected pregnant women, and then they had babies with tiny heads. It just yeah. was freaky. And so all the resources that would go to, doing the normal control of ticks went to Zika and that's what's happening. Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases are largely an invisible disease and we don't have good tests for them. So, uh, and now this year there's no tick education or prevention no. or care on that disease because everything's in COVID, going to COVID. So just, just to go back. So they took yep. CRISPR and they, mm-hmm. what, they neutered the male mosquitoes. And then yeah, they created a genetically modified mosquito that was sterile. Right. So then uh, they thought the females would mate with the men and then they would not get pregnant. And so they, w- they wouldn't have as many babies that season. But for some reason, there are more mosquitoes the next season. So I, <sighs> I haven't read the details on why, or I don't know if they know why. It just I makes just, you... It, it's it, complex. Yeah, and it makes you wonder about the sort of interventions that we're doing currently and have been doing over the last 12 months, what potential things that could be unleashed. Acting, you know, acting in the middle, in the midst of a crisis and making decisions that could be really deleterious for our futures. Yeah, uh, one of my favourite movie lines is by Ian Malcolm, the chaos theory scientist in Jurassic Park. And I put it in my book. It's just just because the scientists can do it doesn't mean they should. So it points to we need you know safe uh, bioethics boards of review yeah. where this kind of research is happening that are active and respected and and uh, but those departments of bioethics are being starved. You know, at all the universities I worked at Stanford for almost. 
10 years and they're just understaffed and underfunded because everybody's chasing the almighty, mighty s- pharma dollar. I was going to say, there's probably not much money in ethics. <laughs> <laughs> So I've probably said that. Nothing that, truer it, has ever been said. <laughs> I've probably said that Ian Malcolm quote at least six times on this podcast over the years. I love, I love that character. Oh my gosh! But it, it, it's, <laughs> it makes the point, you know. You know, did does, do people go around looking under the dinosaurs' skirts? You know, and and they they did things with good intentions, predicting an outcome. I know it's fiction, but you know, like you said, life finds a way. And um, you brought up the NIH and ethics. This sort of plays a role in what's happening now because I've I've been reading a bit about the origins of COVID-19 and correct me if I'm wrong, but certain ethically questionable research was banned in the States a few years ago, wasn't it? Gain of function research? Yeah, Yeah, I think the University of North Carolina or... Uh, one of the North Carolina universities, yes. Um, and I believe that's when it was outsourced to China. Mm-hmm. To the Wuhan lab, which has a pretty bad safety record. Yeah. And I, I thought it was jaw-dropping this week that the former head of the CDC, Redfield, came out and said he absolutely thinks that there's a potential that this is a lab accident. He says, I'm a virologist. It's, it happens all the time. Viruses are wily little critters and they get out. So that's what he thinks. And then people are questioning the WHO troop of scientists that went to China who were only given the information that China wanted them to have. Yeah, so definitely. There, there are still outstanding questions and the united the people who worry about this in the u.s are saying hey the jury's still out and i i agree because with the book you know what i did was uh, my central question that i needed to prove with as much evidence as possible before i published is was this group of pathogens tick-borne pathogens that came out in the late 60s natural or unnatural so i i met with an expert who wrote a paper on that the government relies on him uh, to tell unnatural, natural, and you know, there he has about eight clues, and you know, the first one is a, a point source outbreak. Certainly, that's true with the coronavirus and these three tick-borne pathogens. You know, is it unusually high sickness and death for both of them? Yes, yes, and and then is it um, uh, point say point source unusual, and then is it a really unusual disease? You know, if you look at the coronavirus, this is what the CDC, former CDC director said. He says, it's just highly unusual for something that contagious and devastating. He says, this is the most devastating virus we've ever seen in human history, you know, to go directly hot from a bat to this kind of effect. Like I was saying, in with a natural evolution system, it's a gradual thing. You know, a parasite is optimized for uh, one thing. It's very economical with its energy. It doesn't like it's a, not a very successful parasite that kills a bunch of people. <laughs> you know, it wants to uh, spread in sort of a stealth mode. Yeah, yeah, there are question marks. I mean, going back to that WHO team, that's um, finally what a year later being allowed to see bits and bobs. I mean, there are question marks over conflicts of interests uh, with the membership of that investigation team as well yeah yeah it's uh, it's very strange but it's become political as well you see um like you know, lyme disease yeah has it what how what's the political angle when it comes to lyme disease um it's the people in power the academic researchers saying lyme is one thing and the people in feeling in the field saying no it's something else and we saw that in the beginning of coronavirus too because yeah, especially in March, they said, oh, it's a cough and a fever and aches. And people are saying, no, we have this really weird lack of smell and taste issue. And they say, no, no, no. And and, he, and not that many people have the, the dry cough and they would be turned away when they really had it. Right. Uh, so there are just, there's so many parallels on the way that 
the the Lyme outbreak happened, how the, our systems failed, and I'm specifically talking about the CDC's failures, how it failed with this Lyme outbreak and with Corona. You know, there was the backing a bad test in both cases. There was um, restricting access to the tests, and there was um, bad surveillance, contact tracing in both cases. And then let's see what else, uh, a narrow disease definition. Yeah. So there are a lot of parallels. And I, I would just say with coronavirus, well, Lyme has been a slow creep. It's an invisible disease. We still 30 years later have, would have no test that works in the first month for Lyme disease. So a lot of times physicians don't know this and it's an antibody test. It's an indirect evidence and they'll give the test and they'll say, Oh, it's negative. And, uh, and it ha- they haven't given the three weeks to develop antibodies. So they'll go on and get chronically ill. Uh, so yeah, I could go on. on. Yeah. That's an interesting parallel between the, the sort of expansion of symptoms. We have something over here called the Zoe app, which was developed uh, with mm-hmm. professor Tim Spector from, blanking on which university it is but it's a public private partnership and it has about two million i think users in the uk now and it's just started i believe in the us and it's a a symptom tracker app so as you said you know back early doors last year we had dry persistent dry cough high temperature were the two sort of main warning signs now i forget the exact number but i think with the zoe app they've got it up to about 30 odd different potential symptoms Mm-hmm. And it seems like this is just expanding, expanding in the same way. You know, when you see your your um, documentary, the the range of symptoms is incredible. Yeah, and we since there's no insurance reimbursement code for chronic Lyme, Lyme in the U.S., we're not collecting that data accurately in the electronic medical records. A lot of mm-hmm. times, the physicians because there's no chronic Lyme, it's not acknowledged as a real thing psychosomatic thing it's called fibromyalgia or ms or chronic fatigue and so we're, we've lost you know uh 10 years of really valuable data that we could use ai to really get to those profiles and i think there's also stigma there's still a denial in the medical community that that long COVID exists there was a huge wall street journal editorial saying it's you know the jury's out in long COVID, and same with uh lyme disease I, I think it's like medical hubris to think, well, antibiotics were in, you know released in 48 and uh, you can kill any germ with an antibiotic in a human. <laughs> That's just not true. No, it's, it's crazy. No. Mm-hmm. What, what are some of the things in the book that really blew you away when you were writing it and researching it for it? Mm, I, I think the, uh, the Lone Star Tick experiments which i, t- I will, take it that's a texas thing is it because it's called lone star yeah. is that where it's native to or am i way off well it it was before these experiments it was way in the south it was in texas but the ticks have a white the adult ticks have a white dot on the back so that's why it's called lone star and these ticks uh are very hardy they did experiments and they found they could be put underwater for 70 days and survive. Willie Bergdorfer said he's put them in his freezer and they've lived a year after they fall out. Uh, so very hardy. They're also, I think, the only tick that has rudimentary eyes on its shoulders. So rather, like the deer ticks are, they sense the world from their little sticky pads on their hands that sense carbon dioxide. And they'll crawl up on a blade of grass and just sway with the breeze and and when a mammal comes up they'll hook on like little velociraptor (laughs) hooks they hook on it even they they call up really stealthily uh so lone star ticks stalk their prey they crawl and swarm so they're very they're the terminator of ticks (laughs) so that's why i think they chose them for uh use in russia you know it's it's cold in Moscow, <laughs> in Ukraine. It's a hardy tick. And then they it, it carries uh, uh, one of their biological weapons, which is spotted fever. That was the deadly version. Uh, it, it can carry that. And, and tularemia, which is on the list, too. So uh, 
they wanted to know if they dropped the tick, how long it would take, how far the ticks would spread with their diseases, carrying their diseases. So they got to a couple swampy fields in Virginia. They cut it, they divided it into meter grids. grids yeah. And then they would put a thousand ticks in each square. They would make the ticks radioactive, first of all. So. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Why are you doing it? Well, it makes it easier to track them. <laughs> <laughs> these ticks were fun. These studies were funded by the Army and the Atomic Energy Commission. So, <laughs> so they would release a thousand ticks in each square, and then every month they would go out and they would collect the ticks in that square and then use the Geiger counter to tell <laughs> how many ticks there were in that grid that had been irradiated and how far they had traveled in the last month. And they did this for months to years. And then, so after they used the Geiger counter, they would take the ticks in that jar and release them back in the square where they found them. So there was continuity in their experiment. And then if it was an adult tick that wasn't radioactive, they would paint their backs with paint so they could continue tracking those. So anyways, uh, this went on. And before these experiments, there were no lone stars ab above the Mason-Dixon line, which divides the U.S., into North and South. Uh, two years after these lone star ticks started, they, they would hitch rides on the um, birds migrating coastal birds. Cause this is the Atlantic bird flyway that goes from South America past Cuba, where they dropped infected ticks up the coast. And so now the lone star ticks two years later, they're established on long Island and all of a sudden people start dying of spotted fever on long Island. And I think it's because this, Deer tick doesn't carry spotted fever. This tick does. And then who knows what happened when they ra irradiated them. And, uh, and, uh, and so now these ticks are moving up the coast. They've hit Maine. It's, there's some in Canada. They're spreading into the Midwest. Uh, so that, you know, and I talked to the scientist who did this is alive, right. has no contrition. And I said, well, did you have to get any kind of approval, approvals for this? And he says, well, I, I just went to Newport News and got a city permit. And then he chuckled. He goes, oh, they'd never let me do that. <laughs> and then I told this to two of the ex, tick experts in the Midwest at universities, prestigious universities. And I told them about this experiment. I was asking, well, would the radiation change things? And they go, well, no, they didn't do those experiments. I said, yeah, they do. Here's the paper. Oh, you could never do that now. <laughs> and are they still radioactive? Well, I think once they died, but... What's the life cycle for a tick? It's uh, usually about two years, three moltings. Right. But what they would do is they'd take a pregnant tick, they'd inject it with radioactive fluid, and then the female tick would lay 2,000 to 3,000 eggs and they would all hatch and then in the scientific paper it says those baby ticks would be radioactive for life wow i just can't believe how nuts they are i know yeah what's that I'm so, so what? what decade was that when they when they released those radioactive ticks that was from about 65 to 69 okay and 71 was the first time they found those lone star ticks in uh long island which is about a five-day bird flight up the coast. They, yeah. The guy who did the tick experiments all, also measured how long it took a bird to fly because that's part of the information. Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking about, sort of like with the Cuba thing. It's not sort of beyond the realms of possibility that it would just bite into a bird and then the bird would fly the 50 miles to Florida or whatever and then that's it, isn't it, into the U.S. or whatever. Yeah. Mm. It's just crazy. <laughs> It is. <laughs> I just can't you believe know, it even it even crosses the mind to attempt <laughs> shit like this. It does. I can't believe yeah. who's supposed to be running this show. Who's who's responsible? Who's meant to? Who signs off on all this stuff? Okay. The other crazy thing about Lone Stars is their saliva. You know, they can bite you, and in an hour of the bite, they have a chemical that gives you a red meat allergy, possibly for life. So, uh, and why is that? I don't know if that's the radioactivity or what, but this is a new disease that has recently been identified. And it, I, I'm doing an article right now about how this affects the people with this because you don't realize 
how many products in your life have uh, animal byproducts in them? So vitamins or uh, Mm -hmm. I talked to one guy in Tennessee and he had this alpha gal thing. He was on a, a bro trip to look at the NFL draft in Dallas and they ate a lot of meat on that trip. And that's when he got sick and ended up, you know, barfing later on, uh, hives. And so he, he also got some other tick-borne disease that gave him arthritic pain. So he was taking an injection of an anti-arthritic drug that was made from hamster cells. Oh, so God. the injection, cause it's made from meat, uh, gave him a rash but so these are the it's or you can just go to a subway sandwich store and say i want a turkey sandwich because i'm allergic to red meat and (laughs) and if they just cut up a ham sandwich on the on the platter people get sick from just the ham sandwich that was cooked right or fixed right before that really it's it's that sensitive some people, there's varying right. degrees. It's a, it's a spectrum. So some, right. some people maybe have to have it ingested. Some people, it's, it can just be a touch. Mm-hmm. And it can be hard to diagnose because some people don't see the tick bite. Uh, some, uh, It's a delayed allergic reaction. So it right. can happen five hours after you eat the burger. And <laughs> so a lot of people, it takes them a while to connect. Why did I just throw up or end up in the ER with anaphylaxis? Five years after, five hours after I ate this thing. Uh, Bill Gates wasn't involved in this project, was he? <laughs> I don't think it's a Fauci plot either. <laughs> no, yeah, he'd love to get his all off red meat as well. <laughs> yeah, I was just um, wondering. Then, have you got an idea of what the solution is to all of this? What? How do you resolve something like this? Basically, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. It's like these epidemics are easy to control when they're in the small circle and now it's growing. So you have to fight a multi-front war. I think the Lyme foundations I talked to are trying to work on preventing chronic disease. I mean, well, back up a little, you have to control the tick populations. You have to better inform the physicians uh, on what, on being aggressive in treating because the implications of chronic disease are so devastating to society and people and families. Uh, and we we need a freaking better test and treatments for people who are already sick. I just analyzed the last five years of Lyme disease grants issued by the NIH, so that's about 335 grants, and I read all the proposals, and out of the 335 grants, only five are going to treatment trials for people who are already sick with Lyme disease, even though there are millions and millions of long Lyme chronic Lyme patients. And then there are very, very few research grants for better testing. And a lot of them are using the lousy approach that hasn't worked so far, which is indirect antibody tests. And if you compare that to AIDS tests, which was identified in about the same year, you know, you can go to the drugstore and order a rapid test for AIDS, HIV AIDS, that is 95% accurate. And you still have to, to get diagnosed for Lyme. You have, still have to go to two doctor appointments, take a two-step test. The first one, which isn't very good, has to be positive before you do the more sensitive test. Uh, and you know, by the time you go through that process, it's expensive, and you might already be have a chronic disease, or you might be dead if you've got some of these deadly tick-borne diseases like Powassan virus or Heartland virus or spotted fever which can put you in a coma in 14 days what um what are the majority what kind of projects are the majority of the research grants going to basic science i would say 70 percent basic science which is watching little fluorescing cells how they jailbreak you know, how the bacteria jailbreak into your cells and the problem with that is it's, yeah, it's funding our research institutions. Valuable information will come out of that. But it's at least 10 years before it helps patients. And we're right. ignoring the problem now because the establishment is saying it's not a problem. Ah, right, because the, the medical establishment refuses to admit that this is an actual problem to start with. Why would we bother funding, funding research into treatments for a disease that we, we uh, don't recognize? Exist. Oh, my yeah. God. And we are, they are working on a vaccine, but... 
Uh, and it's in a phase. There's two of them, and they're in a phase one trial, which a safety trial. We don't know how they're going to be, but. Oh, well, uh, it should be ready in about nine months then. <laughs> because uh, we can do them really quick and give them to, what, 30 million people in this country now. So that's a, that's good news, isn't it, Chris? <laughs> but my, my point after looking at the history of Lyme disease is it's not just the Lyme disease that's the problem. You know, if you had just Lyme disease, you if you're healthy, you might get over it. It's the pylon, or I call it the germ gangbang. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, sexy. <laughs> what are the what are the like the practical things people can do? Because I mean, it's it's people who are going out sort of in in the wilderness and in fields and stuff. Are there practical steps people can do to, to look after themselves? Yeah. So, uh, religious tick checks in your children and yourself. Uh, uh, if you're in a tick endemic area, uh, don't re wear your clothes. I mean the ticks can hang out on your clothes overnight. I, and you have to put them in a dryer to kill the ticks. Um, I would say there are some sprays. There are some toxic ones and not so toxic ones, and you can find them on the internet. I would say if you come down with the summer, summer flu and, and especially if you pulled out an, a bloated tick, just get on doxycycline as soon as possible. Because one thing that isn't con- controversy about the disease is early treatment with doxycycline works. Yeah. So convince that doctor, you have to give me this antibiotic. It's no big deal. Two weeks of antibiotics are not going to kill you, but <laughs> the how, diseases could. How, how, how early is uh, Sorry, Chris. How early is early? How early do you have to be on the meds? I, I would say a f- the first... It, um, within the first month of the tick bites, good. Second month is doable. Once you get six months out, it gets really entrenched deeply in your neurological system, in your brain, in your joints. And, and then the other thing is if you think you have chronic Lyme, know that the tests are bad in the first month and you might have to retest. Uh, you will have to be your own advocate for your help if you have cro- health if you have chronic Lyme because a lot of the doctors have been indoctrinated with false information. So you have to, so don't try to, if you have someone who says, no, Lyme is rare, find a doctor who's really experienced. So it would be like, if you had a rare brain tumor, you would, your life is at stake and you would find a doctor who had successfully treated a lot of cases, Mm. someone experienced. So find someone who's really experienced in treating tick-borne diseases. There's a really good site, LymeDisease.org. And in the U.S., you can look up, uh, uh, you know, the doctors in your area who yeah. have been trained properly on what to look for and how the strategies on treating, because the germs aren't all treated with one drug. You have to, like for Babesia, you have to use an anti-malaria and there's a, usually, and you have to start out slow if you have a high germ load or you'll get really, really sick. And there's a strategy in the order that you beat back the germs that works better than others. Yeah. And don't take no for an answer. Because, I mean, right. one of the things that was striking about your documentary was how um, vested interests and insurance companies and whatnot were going after the doctors who were helping people. Is this still an issue, or is there plenty of doctors now who will, who will treat this and recognise it for what it is? No, it's still an issue. <laughs> so, right, uh, the interesting thing, in September in Texas, there's going to be a class action suit. Uh, carried out by patients against a lot of these people that are saying Lyme disease is easy to treat and easy to cure. It's in Texarkana, Texas. And um, they, these are very clear cut cases in that because delays or refusal of treatment pretty much ruin these patients' lives. So while you have that suit going on and there's, I think, five or six doctors named, some of those five or six doctors are in a suit going after the medical licenses of another East coast doctor. So it's like, spy. it's like, it's a rumble. Well, we're, we're rocking up to an hour already, Chris. It's uh, been fascinating though. I've certainly learned a lot and um, I look forward to checking out the book. It's been brilliant. Thanks for coming and sharing, uh, oh, yes. sharing your research with us. It's been great. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate just, uh, spreading the word just about taking tick bites seriously. Yeah. 
yeah, um, don't forget, go to the uh, the website, www.chrisnewby.com. The link will be in the description, as always. And um, stay on the line for us, Chris. We'll be back in a flash. Don't touch that dial. <laughs> Right then, we're back. The dwarf, the cripple, and the mother of madness. That was our chat with Chris Newby. Yeah, yeah. You can go to www.chrisnewby.com. I'm going to check out the book, the book Bitten. Sounds great. Mm. And you can get it on Audible as well. Yeah. Get the audio version if you've got some credits. Quite often, um, I like picking books based on their cover. And I think her book has an excellent cover. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Bud? Yeah, I'll probably get it on Audible because um, I don't have time to read. No, <laughs> you just walk and listen. Just walk and listen. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that one. Some pretty wild, wild mm. stuff going on. Sort of experiments yeah. gone wrong, and with evidence, though, that's the best, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Often well, the truth is crazier than fantasy. Mm-hmm. Fiction. <laughs> no, it's good. Good. Do do check out the stuff. A lot of interesting um, stuff on our website. I think I alluded to it during the podcast. The uh, different uh, screenshots and photos of uh, stuff from the Cold War and documents and whatnot. It's cool. And that map. There's like an interactive, uh, like a map that shows the cases from 1992, I think, to 2008, and they just start, like she says, in. A, Ready. couple of areas and then blah, 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 blah. It's yeah. on the rise over here, Lyme disease in the UK. Is it really? The reports yeah. recently, yeah. Mm, yeah, I've seen, this is the thing. When, I was surprised when she said that it's denied um, sort of medical support or, you know, that it's for a long-term thing because all the, the, the small amount of reading I've done about it is kind of describes it as a long-term disease that, like, once you get it, it's... Is that from our sources? Yeah, it must UK be. sources. Well, yeah, yeah, not USA. Yeah, maybe we were throwing them under the bus. Maybe. Anyway. Housekeeping. 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 This is a value for value podcast. If you find this podcast valuable, please return some port. Uh, Support. <laughs> Please consider supporting us and returning some value. There's a myriad ways of doing this. You can uh, give us a five star uh, review on iTunes. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Odyssey channel. We get a little um, crypto kickbacks from Odyssey, which will help oh, yeah. with the running of the the show and paying the bills. That's all appreciated. Mm-hmm. You can send us um, artwork. If you want your artwork to be the artwork for an episode, as long as it's 1,400 pi- squared pixels, between 1,400 and 3,000 squared pixels, we can use that. And as long as it's not, you know, pilfered, copyright-free, original work or parody or something that we can get away with. Uh, send us news articles, media clips, mm-hmm. things that you find interesting. There's always, every week, there's weird stuff going on, weird news stories, isn't there? Oh, yeah. And uh, so, you know, we need our network of producers to filter in because we we all have so many pair of hands and so much time in the week to get through all this stuff. So that's useful if you can send us stuff. We've been sent some good stuff this week. Can't always get through it all because time is finite, a finite resource, but we try to and uh, pick the best bits out. Um, Go to the uh, loot chest. Go go down to the show notes. You'll find the... uh, yeah, you'll find the link for the Amish loot chest where you can get your merchandise. Amish Inquisition hoodies, Amish Inquisition mugs, flamethrowers, whatever you want. <laughs> Might uh, try and squeeze some new merch in, I think. I think we need to come up with some more yeah. ideas for merch. Hey, if you've got an idea for merch, a line of merch, send it us. That's all part of becoming a producer. This is a crowd-funded, crowd-produced... Listening experience. (laughs) 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 What? Porn hub. Well put. (laughs) Well put. Oh, porn (laughs) hub. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is there? Did I did I miss anything that a producer can do? Uh, ben, there was one thing. Was it, wasn't there something about tossing some money? Toss a coin to your witcher. Cut out Old Valley Greek. of Plenty. Old Valley of Plenty. Asna! <laughs> People Toss have got to understand vaccination is witcher. going to be, in the Old end, your route plenty. to liberty. I think you're hitting, hitting the point, Phil, that, uh... Cut out grape. Yeah, you can uh, go to thearmsinquisition.com and you will find a PayPal donate button there and you can set up a... A one-off, one-off for a monthly donation. Um, I got a message this week from Mama Bear, Mama Bear from Sunny Essex. Some issues with the donating system. Oh, Ooh. yeah, she was struggling to. I thought I had it set up where you could leave a message when you signed up for a monthly donation or gave us a one-off, uh, but she was struggling. So I've not had time to look into it this week, but. I mean, we were a bit hamstrung with the website, really, because it's it's just like a bolt-on, isn't it, to our hosting yeah. from our hosting provider. You know, ideally, if if the donations continue to grow and get to a certain level, that will be my first thing to do is get a a standalone, you know, really good website that's uh, more malleable and can be can do what we want, really. I mean, there should yeah. be a way of messenger, messing, messaging us directly through the website was another comment I think Mum and Bear raised, which would just make things mm -hmm. easier, wouldn't it, rather than emailing some sort of contact form or something, maybe, I don't know. But yeah, I'll look, a, into, I'll, yeah. Uh, I'll look into that when we can. Yeah. So um, I, I guess I should thank the producers, shouldn't I? You must. Is it that time? Yes. Uh, I did have a list. Oh, I've got it here. I've got it here. So, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm not really with it tonight. Okay. Producers for episode <laughs> 177. Mama Bear from Sunny Assets, Gav Scott, Tamborista 2020, Wandering Wyatt, Online Chemistry Tutor, Nomi Noznodge, and Anonymous. You're so amazing in your love. They are. Yeah. Chest feeding. So. Chest feeding. Amazing. And they're. Chest feeding. Love. Uh, I've been coming to terms with the fact that I am. Fuck Chest feeding. Vegan. Ooh. <laughs> it really bothers me. Literally. The best mate. The dwarf, the carad, the grape, the homophobe, the wings, the uh, tosilizu map, the fucking vegan, the lion dog face pony soldier, the asna, the crump up cunt, the number 11, the sexy deposits, the blind man, the communist on the horizon, the cripple and the mother of honey bickering from like a judgment day and terminating mode like right on. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> thanks for your support for another week. We had uh, we got an interesting Instagram follower this week. Is it um, mm. an ex-president of the United States? Not an ex-president. Um, I uh, clicked on our little like button and uh, someone had liked our... Because uh, I'm literally a communist. Hoodie photo. Here's Morgan. Not Piers Morgan. And uh, someone I'd like to are... Because I'm literally a communist. Mug photo. And uh, I clicked on said person's profile. Uh, Was it Stalin? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, queer underscore lefty. Oh, oh right. Yeah, she, uh, they, sorry. Someone who puts pronouns in their bio. They, them. Okay. They like our literally a communist merch um, in a pro in their profile. <laughs> uh, it Excellent. lists it lists leftist entrainment, communism, intersectional feminist, eco socialism, and sin. That's an anarcho syndicalist. Um, Marxist.org. Right. 
So did they buy a hoodie? <laughs> <laughs> most most importantly, no, no, they what did they buy? <laughs> they, yeah, they didn't buy anything. They seized the means of production and, uh, and forced oh forced us to make a hoodie for them. <laughs> And all the mates, the cronies. Mm. So that's how it fucking works, you idiot. Kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Weird. I think I think they will be sorely sorely disappointed if they ever listened. To the podcast. Yeah. They, they, re- they didn't they didn't realise that our merch is ironic, I don't think. No, they did not. No. Nope. Unfortunately. <laughs> COVID-19 news. If you let it rip, they would get infected very rapidly and soon be filling up your hospitals and unfortunately your morgues. Vaccination is going to be, in the end, your route to liberty. I wish we could vaccinate against stupidity. Uh, tos, tosilizum, mum. In the same ballpark as seasonal influenza. From hell. Uh, the magic vaccine. It's not going to allow us to go completely back to normal. Because we're getting bored and we want to have fun. Read the standing orders. Read them and understand them. The UK government's uh, COVID regulation bill extension went through this week. Yes. Yeah, so in the UK, our government passed regulations back in March, and um, one, one, after they'd had their arm twisted, they put in a sunset clause on the regulations for six months, didn't they? Oh, back in the day they did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was it was renewed, mm-hmm. well, six months ago. <laughs> Yeah, and it's yeah. come up again, and it's just been renewed for another six months. That'll carry through so till September. Yeah, to nearly October time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There was uh, no amendments. No amendments allowed. No. Have Have you been out on in in the streets holding a pint of milk yet? Do you know? I have the clip, but it's four minutes long, man. Uh, this is Charles Walker, MP, isn't it? Yeah. Who uh, is um, well known for being a mental health advocate in Parliament and respected in, in that regard. But he uh, got up and did a speech. He's, he's against all the... Well, particularly from previous clips we've played, is against criminalisation, criminalising people seeing their family <laughs> and criminalising protest. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is a fine hill to die on, I would say. If you're going to have a hill to die on, that's pretty fundamental, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, he did a speech, didn't he, about he's going to start a one-man protest with the, over the price of a pint of milk. Yeah. It's just sort of making a point, really. Mm-hmm. That, um, I mean, the, the sort of crux of it was that protesting is a freedom, it's not a right. Mm-hmm. There's a difference. And he, I like the way in his speech he talked about pouring the milk away if I so choose. In other words, it's sort of uh, analogous to your health. You can decide to go to the drive-thru every morning and then have a bacon butty at dinner time and then go to KFC on the way home before you have your tea. Can't you, Ben? <laughs> so hey, you, you missed out about the mocha chococino. <laughs> the point is, it's like, that's your freedom of choice. You're yeah. you, you're judging the risk. It's up to you. You're a free, sentient <laughs> being, and you should be allowed to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, <laughs> and also fat. Yeah, but you know, if no that's, longer, <laughs> no longer. What about this bloody um, CVS in America giving out, saying if you come and get a vaccine, we'll give you a fucking donut. Ooh, well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Krispy Kreme. I've heard Krispy Kreme. Aren't they it's Krispy Kreme. Donuts? Yeah. Giving donuts away. So people, there's all these f- fucking tides on Twitter posting <laughs> selfies. These fat fuckers <laughs> posting selfies with the vaccination card and a donut hanging out the mouth. Mm. It's like, I mean, it just boggles the mind. That is one of the, the number one correlation is, well, one of the worst correlations with uh, not doing so well with COVID is obesity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Number one is age. I think number two might be obesity. That's all the other risks that come with being very obese. Yeah, yeah, obesity is a proxy, isn't it? 
for mm. yeah. you know type two diabetes, heart disease, everything. Mm-hmm. You know. But yeah, the, I mean, we talked a bit with Chris about the sort of myopic obsession we've got with this one disease. In fact, it might have been before mm. we started recording. Mm. You know, but yeah, we're I mean, the, I mean, the point he's making, Charles Walker, is well, he didn't say this. I'm saying it, but 450 <laughs> people die a day of cancer yeah. in this country. Yeah, we could ban alcohol and tobacco tomorrow, and that mm-hmm. that number would shrink. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't we do it? Why don't we do that? Tax. <laughs> Cultural norms, isn't it as well? Like well, drinking yeah. thing, especially. sugar. We could ban sugar. Do you remember yeah. uh, Demolition Man? Uh, oh yeah. Well, this is, I've still not got round to watching it again for its many, <laughs> many um, analogies and and truths. Yeah, he's in Taco Bell and he says, "Pass me the salt." Yeah, you can't have salt. It's illegal. It's bad for you. Mm-hmm. This isn't what where we want to end up. So. Well, there is. Well, there is a sugar tax, is there not? Did that not get get through? Yeah. And uh, aren't most chocolate bars shrinking to around about so they're around about two hundred calories or less, I believe. Taxation is seen as a better, uh, well, better than banning. There's no sugar ban, but there's a sugar tax. There's no cigarette oh, ban, it, but yeah. there's a yeah. cigarette tax, and it's like I don't know if it's yeah. more than fifty percent of the price of a packet of cigarettes now. Though. Goes on tax. Oh, 70, I, I think. I don't know if it's that higher. Is it? So it is, right. Okay. So it's a huge amount. And similarly with alcohol. Yeah. Taxation is used as coercion, isn't it? To, to alter your behavior mm. yeah. and as a fundraiser. Well, that's it. There's, there's the dichotomy, isn't it? They want us to buy more fags and beer, but, and, and we do. And, um, you know, at the same time, there's that. Well, it's bad for you, so we're going to put the tax up. But at the same time, we want you to buy more so we get more money. <laughs> <laughs> That's bunk, isn't it? But yeah, I'm, I'm not. We will not play. It's too long. The Charles Walker thing, four minutes. But it's been all over the English press anyway this week. If people want to, some people are sort of put it, on our, uh, oh. put it on our socials. Yeah, it'll be in the show notes. The link will be in the show notes anyway, and the assets down at the bottom. Uh, should anyone want to check it out? But I, I, I watched the debate. That's how fucking bored I've been. And okay. uh, about the bill, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, there was quite an interesting moment um, where Mancock sort of <laughs> Mancock squirms a bit. He's asked about can we? Yeah. He's asked repeatedly, can we have data? of the number of people who've died of COVID af- um, at least three weeks after a vaccination. Mm-hmm. You think that would be pretty something pretty obvious to collate, wouldn't you? Anyway, let's see what he says. Okay, my right honourable friend. He answered a question for me on this very subject, and he said that the data was not available. And I can't understand why crucial data such as the number of people who have been vaccinated for more than three weeks, who are then admitted to hospital and then subsequently die, is not collected. Why is it? Um, uh, uh, this, uh, this data has been, um, has been, uh, has been collated uh, recently. It's in the so-called SIREN uh, study. From- Bullshit. It's not in the SIREN study. The SIREN study is about healthcare workers getting reinfected. It's nothing to do with people dying three weeks after vaccination from public health england so i will i will i'm very happy to uh, look into exactly the data that uh, my honorable friends are looking for and if we have it publish it uh, and my from what from what was asked for i think that we do have it yeah so it hasn't been collated it's in the start siren study yeah if we have it we will publish it uh, then so, do we have it or not then Hancock. Then, but I will. Uh, we'll let's let's try to do that by correspondence. Let's make sure that we're getting it exactly. Let's do it by correspondence, so we won't publish it. We'll do it privately via email. <laughs> uh, uh, what's being looked for? Because on the face of it, he's absolutely right. It's it, it is exactly the sort of thing that we're looking at. So I, I want to make sure that we get the details of that right. So I imagine the, the numbers are horrific. Then, yeah. if he doesn't want to publish it, 
We've no idea. We, we can't say. Well, that's what I'm going to say. No. I mean, we, we've a, a dearth with a black hole. I mean, it's something that would be interesting to know, wouldn't it? Surely just to see how effective the vaccine is. You know? Yeah. Um, but again, yeah. it, it, it's, if it's going into people that are at the age that people die, a good chunk of them are going to die, aren't they? Oh, but it's saying it's specifically people who die of COVID after oh, receiving... and have been vaccinated. Oh, right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not just old things. people. No, it's very specific. People, right. it, you know, it's, it'd be a good way of monitoring how effective the vaccine is. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like we give a shit because no, because we bought it now, aren't we? So we might as well use it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, Jonathan Ashworth. Mm-hmm. Sorry. No, I was just saying. Yeah, that just seems very logical, doesn't it, to do that? And why was it not thought of immediately mm. when you've paid billions for a vaccine and are going to continue paying billions for one? Yeah, uh, on the same sort of subject, um, Jonathan Ashworth, he's the Shadow Health Secretary. He uh, he uh, made an interesting point. Um, this is the guy who would take Hat Mancock's job if uh, Labour were elected. He'd be no longer be Shadow Health Secretary. He would be the Health Secretary after a future election anyway, is what he's talking about, which I found interesting. Because vaccination alone, frankly does not make us bulletproof. It does make us safer, but we are not safe until we build population immunity and we roll out vaccination everywhere across the world. Uh, I asked the Secretary of State last week about vaccination of children. He quite rightly said we have to have to wait for the research and the clinical trials, although yesterday it was suggested that vaccination of children could start as soon as August. If safety requirements are met, I hope ministers are, are commissioning the JCVI now with producing a plan for how children's vaccination could roll out, because it will be an important uh, uh, way in which we can uh, uh, drive down uh, uh, transmission. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard any politicians really talk about it, only SAGE members and scientists before, but it seems that this is a foregone conclusion. Maybe in time for going back to school in September. You might uh, you might have to have a jab before they let you in the classroom. <laughs> well, this is the thing: if you choose not to have it, are they going to do the, the same thing about you know, like some schools were doing with the testing? If you chose not to have a test, then you have well, you, you can you got to we- have one. Well, you got to wear a mask. Special room. Might wear a yeah. mask and go to the naughty room. Yeah, wear a, a COVID, a coronavirus uh, stitched onto your lapel or something. Yeah, just put a fucking yellow star on them and be done with it. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. It might not happen yet, but it, it seems that's that's the direction of travel anyway. Would you go the same as the flu? I mean, we have we have we give our children the flu vaccine every year, and there is a consent process whereby you receive a letter, and you, you know it's the, the classic school trip tear off slip. Yes slash no. I consent to my child having the the flu vaccine. I don't see why you wouldn't have that same use that same process. Why did they get the flu vaccine? To, well, to stop them spreading it to um, old people who are vulnerable, and then will die of flu. I imagine. Well, I thought I my understanding was that they had it sort of three and I'm not, I'm going to get this wrong, but I thought it was like three and four year olds were offered it because my eldest son has had it once or twice because he was offered it through the the gps thing the flu but then i'm sure i read that then after that they weren't offered it it was just those yeah which i found a bit weird but is it it's up to six i believe and then it's that three to four age group is is offered and i don't think there's there's one available that's for because it moves to a different type for over sixes. I might be getting this completely wrong, but I know that mm-hmm. that um, the one that's offered to my daughter is the nasal spray. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure we get that letter every year. The risk profile in kids for flu is very different, isn't it? Right, yeah. Which is why I think they so give kids the flu vaccine. 
Uh, the other the issue... The risk is much less, isn't it, with coronavirus? So, yeah. I don't know. And there's still question marks over transmission, efficacy against transmission, isn't there? With the coronavirus vaccines. So, I don't know, yeah. it'll be uh, every individual parent's decision whether they want to do it or not, won't they? Won't it? Uh, the worry is, is that if people, are, uh, kids are punished for not having it, I would have a problem there. I also would have a problem, which is where that consent process should kick in. Yeah. That already exists. Yeah, uh, this is from the Telegraph, I think. Vaccination campaign in the UK is set to be expanded to children from August. A leaked report has revealed. This is how this government does everything. They leak everything and then gauge the reaction before they decide what they're going to do about it. Uh, the bid to jab the young is aimed at achieving herd immunity. Right. Uh, where does it say? Children could receive, receive a coronavirus vaccine from August, a plan leaked to the Telegraph reveals. The ramped up effort is aimed at speeding up herd immunity, whereby the virus is no longer spreading in the population. The government has to hold fire until data from an ongoing child vaccine study by Oxford University confirms its safety and efficacy. So, yeah. The uh, conclusions for the study are due in June or July. And presumably this will be another emergency use authorisation. It won't be a full licence, will it? It sounds like it. Mm. Would it be in that quick... I mean, they may have started the study at the same time as they started the adult study, but it's still, uh, A, I doubt it, and B, it it's still quick, even at that speed. No. Well, anyway. The thing is, is, the good thing about that, potentially, in terms of like vaccination, is if this roadmap or whatever actually goes to plan, then all restrictions are lifted, aren't they, in, on the 21st of July, June, sorry, which is before the point of obviously before this vaccination thing so people might not might care less at that point about getting kids vaccinated well you would hope if the vaccine is 100 percent effective as advertised against illness and death severe illness and death that coronavirus should be wiped out well it should be pretty much wiped out now uh yeah, yeah it when, just be like getting a cold yeah i mean all the vulnerable Oh, have all the vulnerable had the first dose now? Well, I think everyone's been, been offered. offered, I think. offered. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think, uh, is it, is it that's up to sort of like eighty, sort of seventy-five, eighty percent take up? Is it something like that? I thought it was higher. No, I thought it was ninety-five in in old and vulnerable people. Really high. In the uh, yeah, in the really old, it's it's way up there. Yeah. So, you know, this time next month, um, it should be over, really. Yeah. I yeah, hope so. I think they're going to try and keep us focused on cases. Yeah. When, definitely. you know, all our attention should be on hospitalizations and deaths. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the worry is the variants, isn't it? That mm -hmm. we're going to see some variants emerge, which evades the vaccine. And then what do we do? Lockdown again. Boosters, yay. <laughs> the boosters, yeah. Yeah, back to square one though, isn't it? Yeah, if that yeah. if that occurs, but I, I mean, it, I think it's only a matter of time, isn't it? Well, yes, but I, I suppose is there not some? Is it not possible that you would be provided some immunity? So if you had the variant, that you wouldn't get as sick as you might have done previously. Yeah, you'd hope so. That's what Mike Eden says. Big says, uh, yeah, like, if I put my baseball cap on backwards, you're still going to recognise me. <laughs> is, that the way, is that the way he explained it? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. What a guy. That's good. Yeah, big fan of <laughs> Japan, vintage Japanese motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, shall we move on to Dr. Doom? Sorry, uh, Dr. Hillary from Good Morning Britain. 
Oh, what's he nice. said this time? So there are new variants, there are uh, surges, um, people <laughs> are ignoring social distancing rules. In France, they're in real trouble with ITU units full. In Italy, they've got uh, almost full lockdown in, in most areas. Germany are, are concerned about another lockdown having to be imposed. So and there's certainly no room for complacency. And, and what we have here is a, is a virus that hasn't changed particularly except uh, with new variants. So it's still very transmissible um, and it's still um, uh, quite lethal for, for, for some people. And we mustn't rely completely on vaccination. No. We've done brilliantly well with, with a, a record number of vaccinations and yes, over 800,000 in one day. The equivalent of vaccinating the entire cities of Southampton, Oxford and Liverpool in one day. But vaccination is not going to be the only way out of this. We're still going to have to abide by restrictions the, and regulations. When we time. look... At it's not going to be the silver bullet. That's what he's saying. Fucking hell. It's like, do you think Dr. Hillary's a government agent. <laughs> it's a spook. He's just like spreading... Inf it's not disinformation, is it? It's information. Well, He's the leak. Yeah. The mole. Mm. <laughs> That's all gonna... of the reports from the, from the cabinet office. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just like piling on that thing that this vaccine isn't going to be the silver bullet. Uh, I know, yeah. And that this is going to have to continue. The, why, why would they say it was going to be the silver bullet then? And then say no. It's like the same thing as what that Justice Sumption or whatever his name was, <laughs> was saying, you know, that it, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't say the vaccine works and doesn't work at the same time. <laughs> you can't do that. Well, hopefully uh, with the warmer weather... The, the, the thing will drop off to practically nothing anyway. I think the big test of the vaccine will be next autumn. And they're already yeah. prepping us, saying we're going to need a booster next autumn. Mm. Whatever. Anyway, um, I, I was listening to the Pandemic podcast with Dan Gregory this week. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a, a doctor of psychology, uh, psychologist Dr. Oliver Robinson. Uh, he was on the Pandemic podcast and... Um, he raised some interesting research I wasn't familiar with regarding um, how social factors interact with viruses, which I thought was pretty interesting. Oh, why's my screen gone off? We had a power cut at Amish oh. HQ. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, no. Is it still recording? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Was in. No, I you're a bit jerky. That's just my, yeah, that's the way I'm sat. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Can hear you? You're frozen there. Yeah. Oh, be all right. Dr. Ollie Robinson, I'll restart my camera while this is playing. Because there's, there's been some very interesting research done by a chap called Sheldon Cohen, um, which uh, is where he, he, he gets a group of people into a, a, a lab environment and squirts a virus up their nose. I mean, so these are people who come in and they know what's going to happen. They know this is going to happen. They're young and healthy and they say, okay, you know, I'll volunteer to have a rhinovirus or a coronavirus or a flu virus squirted up my nose. And then he sees who actually gets ill. Now, so for, for, for decades, we've known that getting ill is not about exposure necessarily to a pathogen. That's a condition. But the majority of people exposed to these viruses, they don't get ill. Who does? People are stressed. And one of the chronic stresses that predicts getting ill is unemployment. And guess what the other one is? Social disconnection. Mm. So if you if you pile on the uh, chronic loneliness and unemployment, which is a major feature of life because of lockdowns for many, you're basically creating a perfect storm of immunosuppressive effects that mean that these people, particularly in disadvantaged parts of society who carry a higher base level of stress anyway, uh, are, uh, get, get, find themselves in a situation where if they do get exposed to the virus, their, their, their defences are down because of the circumstances. I thought that was pretty wild. Yeah, that's yeah, it I'm makes a lot of sense, though. I've not thought of about that, but we talk about that in my job quite a lot. Sort of, Is it cortisol, Ben, the stress hormone? Yeah, cortisol. Yeah. Cortisol. 
cortisol. I think it might be cort- I might be wrong. Cortisol, I think it's, it's either a Zoll or a Zone. Yeah, I think it's cortisol is the stress hormone, and cortisone is the thing they inject into your joints, isn't it? It's like a painkiller. Is it a steroid cortisone? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, like it suppresses your immune system and um, potentially uh, you get more more ill, potentially, yeah. Yeah, interesting. It's another one of those sort of unintended consequences that we've probably just made people a lot sicker, haven't we? With mm. the uh, with the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Oh, mm. and yeah. Hopefully it'll all come out in the It's way. like obesity we were talking about earlier being like a, a factor in, uh, in getting sicker. Stress is a similar sort of condition. Um, you know, it's one of those things that a lot of people suffer <laughs> from, but can have a can have a, a big detrimental effect on you on your overall health, similar to obesity, but we just kind of live with it because we think it's a, a fact of life, uh, stress and, uh, and enjoying food. <laughs> oh. Whoa, what's going Whoa. on? <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, Something's gone wrong with the camera. I think it might be the power supply. But, uh, <laughs> no. That's a good uh, profile beard shot. <laughs> <laughs> It looks I, like you're bold, completely bold, and ha- have a mohawk. <laughs> there we go. That's better. It's called an undercut. Oh, is it called undercut. fashion, darling? It's called, an, yeah, <laughs> it is, sweetie. Look it up! <laughs> <laughs> um, I found, uh, speaking about unintended consequences of lockdown, there was a, a crazy story this week. Uh, I can't remember where it's from. It was to do with a study done by the United Nations, UNICEF, I think. COVID disruption led to nearly a quarter of a million infant deaths in South Asia, UN estimates. Closed clinics and suspended health programs are thought to be behind the large numbers of extra deaths in young children. COVID-19's disruption of healthcare in South Asia led to nearly a quarter of a million young children's death last year, the United Nations has estimated. Uh, An analysis of the impact of closed clinics and suspended health programs suggested there'd been a large large numbers of extra deaths soon after birth or from malnutrition and childhood diseases. Modelling from the UN's children's body, UNICEF estimated that there had been 229,000 more deaths among under fives than in 2019. Three out of five of those deaths were thought to be more among newborns. Yes, we're going to be counting the toll for decades, aren't we? Yep. The research in Afghanistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka... This is only even account for Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, also estimate an extra 89,000 stillbirths over the year. The report called Direct and Indirect Effects of COVID-19 Pandemic and Response in South Asia looked at the effect of government lockdown strategies on healthcare, social services, education and the economy. So uh, pretty nasty stuff, really. But I think we should be aware of it. It's just more data, isn't it? You know, but we drum in that messaging around the dangers of COVID pretty diligently for a full two week period of sustained propaganda. But anyway. Yeah, should we move on to some miscellaneous stuff? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah what time are we on? Um, we're making good time. Good time. There was a crazy story uh, that Malin covered on the Malin Baker show. Good friend of the show, Malin Baker. Yeah, previous guest. Uh, It's an astounding policy introduced in Denmark this week. I have a clip. Meanwhile, on the same topic, in Europe, something fairly startling took place at the end of last week. Denmark announced that it is to limit the number of ethnic minorities in neighbourhoods to up to 30% in a bid to reduce the risk of religious and cultural parallel societies. This followed its decision earlier in the year that parts of Syria, still in the grip of civil war, were nevertheless safe enough and became the first European country to deport Syrians back there. So they're putting, like, totals on ethnic minorities in neighbourhoods up to 30%. So you... 
potentially couldn't move somewhere because of your ethnicity. Yeah. Nuts, isn't it? So, I... That's insane. Hang on a minute. So, so what happens if you're white? You're not an ethnic minority. All right, okay. So it's not just any ethnicity then, it's just ethnic minorities. Is that what it said? That's what it said, yeah. Hang on. Meanwhile, on the same topic, in Europe, something fairly startling took place at the end of last week. Denmark announced that it is to limit the number of ethnic minorities in neighbourhoods to up to 30% in a bid to reduce the risk of religious and cultural parallel societies. Mm. Mm. Pretty wild, that, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah. That's an odd strategy. <laughs> It seems that there's there's fallout. Do you remember the migrant migrant crisis from it's 2015, 2016? Mm. And um, parts of Europe sort of opened up their borders, really. Yeah, Germany, Germany in particular, yeah. Sweden. Yeah. And um, the, the, it seems that there's a problem with integration, which is causing friction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's I mean, it's it's kind of to be expected, isn't it? When cultures are so different, yeah, I think this is the thing, isn't it? That is quite often said in our country. I think with the the speed of change. So you know, like in Germany, especially, I think it was almost a million. Yeah, look at almost a million refugees or whatever you want to term um, into the country. That's a massive amount of people to try and settle and and rehome and integrate mm. into society. But, I mean, from their kind of point of view, if I was sort of moving to Germany, I think, well, I don't know, I'm not going for a war-torn uh, country or whatever, but um, there would be that likelihood where you'd probably want to stick around the people that you know and the culture that you know. Yeah. I feel like I've terrified Phil. With your analysis, I haven't there, petrified him. <laughs> literally, no. uh, it seems that it's it's a crazy strategy for a, for a government to come up with. I think. Yeah, one to look at, I guess. One to uh, keep an eye on. Mm. I mean, there must be uh, there must be a serious problem for them to take steps like that. Yeah, and the other thing is, is can that even be enforced? Are they, uh, they're part of the EU, aren't they? The, EU, the European Court of um, Human Rights kind of thing? Denmark are EU, aren't it? It's Norway, Norway which aren't. They're a That's third I mean. nation. So, yeah. I believe. So you, would, you would think that you would, you're basically being discriminated upon because of the colour of your skin. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Anyway, we'll move on. Um, I listened to an interview on Unheard this week. Oh, yeah. Freddie Sayers, the yeah. hostess with the mostest, the interviewer of... Interviewer? His, his intellect is like a sword. <laughs> <laughs> and he's uh, an excellent interviewer. He had Professor Shanna Swan on this week, who is a sperm expert. Oh yeah, and there isn't. There's nothing she doesn't know about sperm, and I've got this clip because it's it's alarming. Well, what we found and published in 2017 was that sperm count had declined dramatically over the preceding 40 years, and was at a point where um, nearly half of men would be entering that range of sperm count, which is associated with subfertility at least, and we didn't see any indication that the slope of that line had leveled off. So that when we looked at the data restricting it to the past 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, you might hope that it would be flattening out, but we didn't see any indication of that, which is alarming because If it were to continue on its present course, well, that's a difficult thing to project, of course, but... This is the kicker. Just mathematically, if you'd extended the line, it does hit zero in 2045. 
So that's the median sperm count. That means half of men would have no sperm. 24 she years. Link, did she link it to plastics or something? Yeah, I can't remember the name of the specific plastics. Uh, is, is it BPA, one of them? The acronym. I thought it began with a P or a PH. Okay. Uh, and they're ubiquitous. They're in fucking everything. Yeah, she said food wrappings. I was seem to remember reading. It's in the food wrappers. Um, and it's an, is it something to do with testosterone? Um, stops the production of testosterone? It, it's freaking me out. You're looking at your phone. It doesn't... Um, it just doesn't just affect women, uh, men either. It's women. Yeah. Women are being affected in the fertility <laughs> game. <laughs> Is it uh, female failings? Sorry, failings. With the yeah. pH. Female failings, yeah. That's the one, yeah. Uh, one of the big takeaways was... <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're doing, talking to a group of children. <laughs> <laughs> this is how professional I'm becoming. That I, even when something goes wrong mid brook, I can just switch and it's like nothing ever happened until you two bring it up <laughs> seamless <laughs> one of the big takeaways was not not heating food in plastic ah oh, shit yes I this in- all the time this in- increases mm. the leech okay yeah and do you know what i like to do with a bit of beans or frozen vegetables i my Bean cold <laughs> <laughs> I microwave them in a plastic bowl. You know why? Uh, I don't know. I don't know why you were doing plastic a plastic bowl. Ben? Uh, I, I've no idea. I'd use a, a, a ceramic one. Yeah, I use a ceramic bowl. Yeah, how hot is that ceramic bowl when you take it out of the microwave? Just as hot as the plastic. Oh, yeah, it's pretty warm. No. No, it doesn't transfer heat. That's why I started implementing that technique in my cooking. <laughs> and it turns out I was killing my children's sperm in the process. Oh, fuck, yeah, the kids. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you obviously think, well, you know, I don't care. I don't want any more kids. But, yeah, it's it's everyone. <laughs> if you want any grandkids, maybe take this to heart. <laughs> yeah, we need to think about the next generation. This is 20, 24 years, her, her this this line follows goes down to zero sperm in half of men. Yeah, because you know that's like for my eldest. Well, both of them will be men by then. Yeah, pretty alarming, isn't it? I was completely unaware of this stuff. Well, I think we've all <laughs> haven't we about male fertility going down. Freddie, being the excellent interviewer, he is he raises the question of well, this is a Western thing. People are delaying having families. Oh, and they're yeah, having definitely. smaller families because of the more a bit, a bit. education of females increases females going into careers, which makes them the de, de, not deliver a uh, delay starting a family. This is the Western thing, and that you know, in other parts of the world, in Africa, South Asia, fertility isn't a problem. Nope, it's worldwide. It's everywhere. Wow. So even in sub-Saharan Africa, fertility is going through the floor. How many microwaves are in sub-Saharan Africa? <laughs> it's a lot of plastic, though. It's it? everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. This, well, it's that this thing shit. about the Teflon, isn't it? It's in everyone, everyone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I would recommend the link will be in the show notes in the uh, one seven seven show assets. Go and check out the interview and get some tips if you want to. If you want to protect your sperm, well, big bollocks. Yeah. Or oh, big geez. big ovaries. Anyway, if 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 we've learned anything from this pandemic, it should be the dangers of Zoom. Yes. Do I need to remind you? Read them and understand them. Uh, particularly if you're a local councillor or a member of some shitty subcommittee. <laughs> so, enter East Hartsfordshire District Councillor Mem- Michael McMullen, who made a rather disparaging comment about another count committee member during a vote, believing that he was muted. Um, comments or questions? 
If not, we'll go uh, to the vote and we'll ask Katie then to, I'm afraid, go through all the names again and if you can say if you're uh, for, against or abstain. Okay, Councillor Alder? For. Councillor Andrews? For. Councillor Boylan? For. Councillor Brady? Abstain. New city girl. New city girl. Oh dear! Oh dear! You know what? He, you know what he didn't do. Read the standing orders. <laughs> Read them and understand them. Yeah, they called her a silly girl. Oh, I bet he's taking some heat for that. Well, let's see what uh, what happened. What's going to be the? This is sixteen days later in another council meeting. <laughs> oh, was it raised in the? This is the, <laughs> the democratic process. So <laughs> fucking pathetic, isn't it? This is the fallout. The comment of you silly girl made by Councillor Michael McMullen immediately following Councillor Mary Brady's abstention, whilst not intended to be heard, was nevertheless inappropriate. Councillor McMullen accepts that he shouldn't have made the comment, irrespective of the circumstances or intention, and wishes to offer an unreserved apology to Councillor Mary Brady and to any others who were offended by the remark. Some equalities training is also being arranged for the end of the month, which Councillor McMullen will attend, and any other members wishing <laughs> to do so can also attend. The guy's like 100 years old. <laughs> They're going to send him on equality training. They want to send him on fucking Zoom training. <laughs> Really? They're going to put him through that? It, it looks about 100. <laughs> you know. New uh, You're never too old to learn, though, are you? Yeah, but, you know, you've got to understand them. Read them the, and understand them! Understand the standing orders, haven't you? He just needs to be reprogrammed, doesn't he? I and mean, then he can be put back in society. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yes. He needs to... Uh, what kind of uh, reprogramming? We drum in that messaging around the dangers of COVID pretty diligently for a full two-week period of sustained propaganda. Yeah, that's what he's lacking. Mm. Ben Shepherd had a Freudian slip on Good Morning Britain this week. They were dicking about with green screen. And uh, Susanna mm. had a green dress on. So the guys in the, in the, uh, in the booth <laughs> decided it would be funny to overlay Susanna's dress just with pictures of Ben's face so she looked like she was wearing a Ben Shepherd face dress and uh, he made this uh, slip of the tongue Mary. that's Susanna's fully in clad in Ben Shepherd of a Ben blanket Actually, like Mary. Quite, I quite like that look. I quite like that my nipples are my what? nipples what <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. it sounds like he's going to say my nipples are hard my nipples are your face. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to say your nipples. My your nose nipples? is your nipples. <laughs> your nipples are my face. Uh -huh. Oh no, oh, I'm on television. <laughs> my nipples. I bet he wants to crawl under a Ben blanket. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. My nipples. Says it twice. My nipples. Uh, yeah. Oh man. One of my favourite things in the world is mixed metaphors. Oh, right, okay, yeah. You know what the concept of a mixed metaphor? Yeah, but you'll have to remind me. So, like, if I said, oh, that Chris Newby we had on tonight, oh, she could talk till the cows turn blue. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's meant yeah, to be. Yeah, Till the cows t come home. Come home. <laughs> or till, you know, till the cows go blue in the face. <laughs> 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 It's what you say. <laughs> yeah, because I like mixed metaphors. There's loads of them. And I was, uh, there was um, a, uh, a retired policeman on talk radio this week, and he was talking about, you know, this Bristol rioting stuff. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, been yeah, riots. Ronald's particularly appalled by this. <laughs> bet, yeah. And, uh, yeah, this retired policeman was on talk radio talking about the protesters in Bristol this week, and he dropped this, this beautiful example of a mixed metaphor. Um what well, unintentionally i believe you know if you know that that's what she's doing mm. and i saw the videos of her shouting in the face of a police mm. officer and i could see that she was deliberately provoking them and she wanted to be thrown to the ground that doesn't excuse it happening and it doesn't mean that doing it is a good idea 
Well, the thing is, what do you do? You're caught between the devil and a rock and a hard place. <laughs> and a rock place. <laughs> well, the thing is, what do you do? You're caught between the devil and a rock and a hard place. <laughs> you don't want to be there, do you? <laughs> no, you don't want between to be the devil, a rock and a hard place. <laughs> well, the thing is, what do you do? You're caught between the devil and a rock and a hard place. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking love it. Yeah, the, the devil and the rock and a hard place. <laughs> That's, yeah. Is that the devil in the deep blue sea? Yes. In a rock and a hard place? Yeah. yeah. Yes, and nice. I believe that devil in the deep blue sea, I believe that maybe has some sort of Napoleonic origins. I'm searching the mind palace now. Oh, I think there's yeah, an interesting... It's the fireplace. <laughs> yeah, there's an interesting story about the... Uh... The origins of the devil in the deep blue sea, but not. Well, the thing is, what do you do? You call between the devil and a rock and a half place. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to implement that one. <laughs> There's the origin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's trapped between the devil and the rock in a hard place. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah. Joe Biden's been let out. Oh, no. He's done his first live press conference this week. Oh, God. And uh, I watched it with a. A keen ear, just to see what he what he comes up with, because you know there's going to be something in it. He can't do a press conference for an hour without making some sort of howler, can he? I, I don't think I could, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> He's got this weird thing about suddenly shouting. Like he'll it, be he'll be talking normally like this, and then all of a sudden he'll do this, and then back back down again. You not notice that all I think that's linked to that. old people. Yeah, having, to, having the telly really loud. I think there's a link between shouting and telly volume. Yeah, I've do got... Th- sorry, go on. I was just going to say, do you think he has a discreet hearing aid? I'm sure he has an earpiece. Yeah. Being fed lines. Yeah. He took a lot of criticism because he was using notes and he had to keep flicking to notes. So the question would come up, question, and it's about Afghanistan, and then he would flip. To the notes, yeah, to the Afghanistan section in massive letters, obviously, because he's practically <laughs> blind, probably. But yeah, I've got a couple of examples of of his weird shouting that I'd like to uh, share with you. To pass the legislation passed by the House, number one. Number two, educating the American public. The Republican voters I know find this despicable. Republican voters. The folks out in the outside this White House. <laughs> Not the best. The second one, I think, is better. Let's try the second one. Two, to rebuild the backbone of this country. The middle class. Hard-working people and people struggling in the middle class. They build America. And unions build them. <laughs> the third reason I said I was running. And they're just back. This is breezy again. Breezy yeah. again after that. Reverb. Yeah, it's an echoey place. Well, they, they're only allowed like four journalists in there, a hundred yards apart. So, is it not the um, he goes starts when he starts talking, he, he's just talking. He goes <laughs> like that. Is that his um, false teeth? Do you think? I don't know. <laughs> he's trying to catch him as they come out. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, listen to this. See what you think. If it holds near and dear to you, that you uh, um, like to be able to. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, uh, there's a little death rattle, like a searching death rattle at the end. It's really quiet, though. I might just turn it out, but I've no idea what he's what he's saying here. Let's let's try again. And so, I'm going to say something outrageous. I have never been particularly poor at calculating how to get things done in the United States Senate. Yeah. So the best way to get something done, if you if it holds near and dear to you, that you. Uh, um, like to be able to. Anyway, I, I, we're ready to get a lot done. If it holds near and dear to you, that you uh, um, like to be able to. Anyway, I, I, <laughs> weird. That is a, that is Aww. a again. I'm sorry to say, an old person thing. Where they're just taking that in breath. It sounds like the day. Big news <laughs> is uh, he's going to run in 2024. No, he's not. That was one of the questions. Oh. Who does he well, think he's kidding? 
He has to say it, doesn't the he? American public. <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, this is this was my favourite one from the press conference. With regard to the filibuster, I believe we should go back to a position of the filibuster that existed just when I came to the United States Senate 120 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> just when I came to the United States Senate 120 years ago. <laughs> You don't even have to write yeah. jokes for him. He just produces them himself. Do you know where uh, his supporters... That face, if that was a joke, and I know it wasn't, but if it was, that would have gone down a storm. <laughs> you know, su- the old guy makes joke about being old. His supporters... It, it would have gone down an absolute storm. His supporters came out and said that that was a joke. You, you idiot. Oh, you, they did? You right? didn't get it. <laughs> well, I watched it. And uh, no, I don't think he was joking at all. He didn't even crack a smile or anything. No, just, you know. Just when I came to the United States Senate 120 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no delivery. That, or he's just reading it, and because he's so senile, he didn't realise that it was a falsehood and therefore a joke. Yeah, I think he's like Ron Burgundy. I think he'll read anything (laughs) that you put in front of (laughs) him. If you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I enjoyed his first press conference. Look forward to the next one. In six mm-hmm. months' time. <laughs> this is it, yeah. Yeah. He called uh, Kamala President Harris this week as well. <laughs> <laughs> For fuck's sake. I just uh, I can't get over it. I think it's wonderful. I think US politics is wonderful. Yeah. It's like this is the best they could do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when was he vice? He was vice president 12 years ago. Yeah. He was seen as like, you've got Barack Obama who's like the young, young fresh, fresh faced, maybe not as experienced politically. I think he was maybe a senator, maybe. For maybe yeah. a term or, to, uh, you know, politically. So, who's the perfect running mate? Creepy Uncle Joe. He's been, around, he's been around for 120 years. <laughs> <laughs> he's a steady hand. He knows how Washington works. Great. Uh-huh. Perfect running mate. Mm. And then 12 years later, he's, mm. he's in the job. Up. It's bizarre. I don't know. But I can't save you if you're not wearing a face mask. <laughs> <sighs> have you got anything else for us not in the clips no I'm pretty much spent oh right okay. we could have done more but uh, it flies doesn't it the last hour yeah, maybe it does does, it does yeah. yeah just when I came to the United States Senate 120 years ago yeah you have no authority here Jackie Lee. <sighs> yeah so I can't have children with a chest feeding oh Shall we uh, sign off? Yeah. So. Let's. That's good. That was a solid podcast. Mm. Who we got next week? Have we even got anyone booked oh, in? I've shit the bed again. I, uh, um, David Roll. Right. Isn't it? Two fighters. <laughs> <laughs> Am I saying that? Have I got the name right? David Roll, Egyptologist? and Do- No, Dr. Coleman. Is it no, not that's East? Later on. Oh, shit. That's the wrong yeah, it's uh, April is EJ month. Yeah, it starts next week. Yeah, with Doctor oh, Roll, Doctor David Roll, Rolling. Rolling, Egyptian, right. Egyptology, mythology, general, just wizard and badass musician, author. Is this, is this the one from Facebook? Yeah, is it the one about the Garden of Eden or something as well? Pretty much anything I think of interest. He's an expert in. Oh, okay, <laughs> space Holy travel. Man. I think it'd be really cool. Fellow Englishman as well. Yeah, we haven't had many Englishmen on, have we? Come to think of it, not for a while. No, I can't remember the last time. Who's the last Englishman we had on? Comet Sam. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Uh, Ryan Seven. Yeah, Ryan. That's, um, that's over a year ago now, isn't it? That's a year yeah. ago, I think. Ryan Dangerous Seven. Dan. Dan the Millennial. Dr. Jamie. Dan the Millennial expert in online dating. Online chem tutor. Yeah. Yeah. Shane. 
Shane Davis. Yeah. Yeah. Pete Tam. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll be good next week. Looking forward to that. A fucking vegan. Yep. I don't know if he's yep. a vegan or not, but it should be good. Yeah, already upset him. <laughs> right, should we go then? Unless uh-huh. yeah. you got anything to add? No. No, good. It's good. Have a good evening. Uh, toss. Mm-hmm. Just when I came to the United States Senate 120 years ago. Wakanda forever, etc. Epstein didn't kill himself. Like a judgment day and terminating more like. It's also holds plural call foreigners accountable. This is such a crock of shit. Do it. Come here, goose, you big communist. The goose. Yeah. I can't save you if you're not wearing a face mask.